Ultimately, we are all made in the image of God. We are now ministers and ambassadors of reconciliation. That process begins with forgiveness. Well, friends, it's great to know again that you've chosen to join us during this half hour teaching ministry through Bel Air Church. It's the second week of a four week sermon series. And a reminder if you've missed this intro from last week, you can go to our YouTube channel, simply search for Bel Air Church on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, get caught up on this sermon series. And in week two of this four week series, we're taking a look at four practices, four spiritual practices that actually will fill the world with hope. These are individual things that we can cultivate and do in our life. And it's not just for us, it's not just for those around us, but it's the world around us. It's what the world needs now. The hands and feet of Jesus, the body of Christ continuing the mission and work of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Well, last week we talked about the spiritual practice of confession. We talked about the joy and the freedom and the vitality that comes when you turn to God and you bring whatever brokenness, whatever mistakes, whatever shame you might have so that God can take that and separate it from you as far as the East is from the West, not because of God's mercy that perhaps could run out, but because of God's justice, because Jesus has already paid it all. Now that in many ways connects to today's message, the spiritual act and the spiritual practice of forgiving others. This is so needed right now. An inability to forgive not only breaks down relationships between you and other people, but it turns you into somebody that's a shell of really who you wanna be and who God longs for you to be. Let me read for us a very short passage in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, after Jesus teaches a bit about the process and the practice of forgiveness. Peter, of all people, asks Jesus a question about how frequently, I mean, is it really that big of a deal, Jesus? This is Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit writes, then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. This, my friends, is the reading of God's word. And as we say every week, thanks be to God. Now, I love Peter for many reasons. This is one of those reasons. He's going to Jesus and he's saying, look, okay, you know, I'll, I'll forgive. But what's the limit? And the word uh, that translates into the word seven, that number, has significant symbolic meaning all throughout Scripture, in both the Old Testament and um, the New Testament. You know, seven is more than just the number after six and before eight. Uh, it's more than um, just what is considered to be, a, you know, a good number. Seven in the Scriptures always meant completion, perfection, wholeness. Uh, it's described in the book of Genesis that God created all things in seven days. Now, the Hebrew word for day can either be a 24-hour period or it can mean a significant length of time. So whether you are what's called a young earth creationist and you believe the earth was created in seven 24-hour periods, there's room in the Hebrew language for that viewpoint. But also, if you are what's called an old earth creationist and actually believe that carbon dating and some of the scientific discoveries of our modern era also line up with that which is revealed in Scripture that are not mutually exclusive, uh, you can actually find that there's room in the Hebrew language uh, because the word for day can also be a significant length of time. That can be millions of years. Either way, the point is that God created all things out of nothing and God created it in wholeness, in completion, in perfection with the number seven being the descriptor of that. And so Peter goes to Jesus, talk about absolute generosity of forgiveness. He says, well, I mean, like seven times? And Jesus says, no, I tell you, 77 times. Some translations say 70 times seven. It is an exponential view. It is a limitless view. It, in some ways, is beyond comprehension of what Jesus is saying to Peter. And that is exactly what we need. 
Now, there's many verses in Scripture that speak about forgiveness. We'll get to a number of those and the need for it and how we can practice it in our life. But let me connect the dots from last week. Remember Psalm 32, and again, you can go back and watch that sermon or you can read Psalm 32. It talks about how when we are unwilling to go to God and bring those things to light, when we hold it in, when we have this secret shame that is inside, that there is this destructive, distorting, heaviness, weightiness, broken downness that we experience in life that actually prevents us from really flourishing. In the same way, if we are unwilling or unable to forgive others, the same thing can happen. There can be this brokenness, this distortedness, this this broken downness in our lives because we are unwilling to extend forgiveness to others. We hold that within. Now, there's a great book that was written, I believe about two years ago by the late Tim Keller, who's a pastor that uh, passed away um, recently. And the book title is called Forgive. And the subtitle is, Why Should We and How Can We? What a great reminder of this impossible, complex topic of forgiveness. Easier said than done, right? But I want to read a quote, and he says this. He says, Wraith, I haven't heard that word in a long time, spelled W-R-A-I-T-H. Wraith is an old English word for a ghost, a spirit that can't rest. Ghosts, according to legend, stay in the place where something was done to them and they can't get over it or stop reliving it. If you don't deal with your wrath through forgiveness, wrath can make you turn into a wraith, a ghost, turning you slowly but surely into a restless spirit, into someone who's controlled by the past, someone who's haunted. Now, this picture is something that I've experienced in my own life, an inability to forgive someone or something or a group of people. Uh, I I carry it in me. Uh, But it's this really profound reality that bitterness and revenge and hate and inability to forgive is something that doesn't hurt the other person. Ultimately, it hurts you. And as Tim Keller says, it turns you into this spirit, this this haunted ghost that is unable to move on. I believe that one of the most foundational practices that can heal friendships, working relationships, family systems, churches, neighborhoods, cities, our nation, our globe, is the practice of forgiveness. But I want to break it down because forgiveness is something that's really often misunderstood. I want to talk about forgiveness and how it's an essential part of reconciliation, but forgiveness can happen without there ever being reconciliation. I want to talk about the difference between forgiveness and trusting someone again. All these things I want to cover because, again, practice, uh, the practice of forgiveness can be either very superficial or it can be deep. And today I want to try to go deeper than just the surface. Now, uh, forgiveness ultimately is when there is an affront, there is an offense, there is a wrongdoing. And in reality, there is then a price that needs to be paid. Forgiveness is not just pretending it never happened. You see, this is an incorrect, uh, unhelpful view of Forgiveness, you know that phrase, you know, forgive and forget. There is this sense of some people thinking that forgiveness is, uh, it doesn't matter, it's not a big deal. And what happens in those moments is that the payment for that brokenness, the payment for that offense, the payment for that wrongdoing has to be paid. And when someone tries to just wipe it away, ultimately what happens is they take it inward. And if you're a person who just says, oh, no, no, forgiveness is something, I'm just going to forget about it, I don't want to deal with it. What's actually happening is that those things are seeping into your heart, seeping into your mind. You might push it so far below your subconscious, but again, at a cellular level, you are going to experience something that will be unlocked and set free if you're actually able to forgive. So some people, they take the pain on themselves. And sometimes it's weeks later or months later or years or decades later 
that the result of that pain finally comes out. So much of our pastoral counseling and the ministry that we do as a church is helping people work through unforgived experiences that sometimes go all the way back to their childhood. They can experience a tremendous stress, something else can trigger in their life, and they realize that they never dealt with this anger and this hurt and this hate and this bitterness towards someone else. They thought they forgave, but ultimately they were paying the cost themselves and it was magnifying, it was growing. Some of you today, you know exactly what that feels like. And the answer is not to stuff it down deeper and deeper and deeper. We'll get to the answer in a moment. But the other end of the spectrum is not that you take the pain on yourself, but you say, oh yeah, there needs to be payment and I'm gonna make that person pay. This is the eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth way of life. Someone cuts you off on the freeway, you're gonna cut them off. They wrong you on social media. They say something, well, you're gonna embarrass them just the same. There's somebody at work who does something, a friend, a roommate, you're gonna get them back. And there can be this balancing of the scales that we do when we make somebody else pay. That's not forgiveness either. That is revenge. And ultimately, it causes this brokenness, not only in the relationship and in the fabric of society, but actually it's not dealt with in a healthy way because I found so many people who have also come for pastoral counseling who have realized that when you make someone else pay, it doesn't truly satisfy the hurt in someone's heart. They think that that will be the solution, that this will solve the hurt and the frustration and the bitterness, but it doesn't solve it. There is a need for something more. True forgiveness realizes that there has to be a payment, but I can't make it and the other person can't make it. So who makes the payment? Well, a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview says that there's only one who can perfectly deal with that payment in a way that can begin the process of reconciliation where there can be true freedom and there can be a flourishing of relationships in the fabric of society and that one person is Jesus. You see, Jesus, when he went to the cross, the book of Isaiah says that he took upon himself all the sin, all the brokenness, all the hate, all the hurt of all of humanity. It was my mistake, it was your mistake, it was the world mistakes that put Jesus on the cross. And ultimately, when I realized that, and what does Jesus say from the cross? Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. When it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that Jesus who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God, there is this beautiful, great exchange that happens on the cross, that Jesus, he takes away our sins and he gives us his righteousness. And as we explored last week, because Jesus paid it all on the cross, God now forgives us, covers us, separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west and remembers it no more. And as it says here in Matthew 18, and it also says in Colossians 3.13, that we are called to forgive other people in the same way that God forgives us. So practically speaking, here's how I think of it. When I make a mistake, I realize that that mistake put Jesus on the cross. That doesn't lead me to shame because instantly I hear Jesus say, Father, forgive Drew. He knows not what he does. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to personalize that as well, that when you make a mistake, rather than running from God, you realize that that thing helped put Jesus on the cross. But what does Jesus say from the cross? He says, Father, forgive Mary. Father, forgive Tim. Father, forgive Zeke. Father, forgive Muhammad, for they know not what they do. From that place that I put Jesus because of my sin, he says to me, Father, forgive them. And God does. And when I realize that I am now forgiven in Christ, out of that overflow, I can look at what somebody else does to me and say, you know what? That thing that they did to me, that also put Jesus on the cross. And what does Jesus say to them? Let's say if it was Cynthia that did something awful to me. I imagine that Cynthia's action put Jesus on the cross, but what does Jesus say from the cross? Father, forgive Cynthia. She knows not what she does. And so I know in that moment that I don't have to pay for it. She doesn't have to pay for it. Jesus has already paid for it. 
And God is a God of justice. And God is mysterious in so many ways. And so when I, in my heart, privately forgive Cynthia, let's say in this case, even if she doesn't even know what she's done, there is something that releases from me. For me having to absorb it, for me trying to go after her and make her pay for it, but it goes to the rightful place, Jesus on the cross, who deals with it through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. You see, forgiveness is a heart posture where we are agreeing with God that a person has been forgiven because of what Jesus has perfectly accomplished on the cross. Now, many people don't experience forgiveness. I wanna be crystal clear. When Jesus went to the cross, and through what Jesus accomplished, God forgave all of humanity, but only some of humanity get to experience that forgiveness when they turn to God in faith in Jesus Christ, bringing that before God, and they agree with God that Jesus has paid it all for them. You see, it's not that we then first ask for forgiveness and then God forgives, no, God forgives first, and then we turn to God and then experience that forgiveness. You might say, well, where does it say that in Scripture? Well, the book of Romans, chapter 5, says that God demonstrates His love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us, paid it all, before we even knew we needed Him to do so, before we asked God for forgiveness, before we confess anything, God extends forgiveness and we get to receive that and experience that when we turn to him. In the same way, you do not need to wait for someone to realize that they made a mistake before you forgive them in their heart. This is especially important if you never see that person again, especially if it's someone from your past, especially if it's someone that's no longer living. Essentially what you're saying is you're saying, God, I'm not gonna carry that. I'm not gonna make them carry that. Jesus, you carried that. And I'm gonna agree with you that you have forgiven them in Christ. That opening step is something that can absolutely transform your view of that person, your view of yourself, your view of God. But that is also a very distinctly different from the process of reconciliation and reestablishing trust. I found many people, they struggle with forgiving someone else because they think wrongly that forgiveness and trust are the same thing. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say somebody's experienced tremendous abuse and they perhaps think, if I forgive this person, I am then condoning the abuse and then I'm gonna be back in the situation where they might abuse me some more. Let's separate those two things. You see, trust is something that has to be earned, has to be established. You can build and earn trust for 20 years and that trust can be extinguished and lost in a millisecond. And it needs to be re-earned, it needs to be re-established through proper boundaries, through a communication, of what is required for trust to be earned, that is distinctly different from forgiveness. So there is a way in which you can forgive someone freely again and again and again, and never trust them again because they haven't demonstrated behavior that is trustworthy. So in those abuse cases, I encourage people to say, you have to draw healthy boundaries, foundational boundaries. And that might be where you have a restraining order. You might live separately for a season to very clearly communicate what it would mean to re-earn and re-establish any sort of trust. But to earn that takes time. And to earn that might never happen. And to reconcile, might never exist. It might be something that the other person doesn't want, doesn't have interest in. They might think they've done nothing wrong. However, forgiveness is something that is distinctly different and comes before and is separate from that reconciliation and trust building process. It is to say, I'm not gonna absorb this, I'm not gonna make them pay, but ultimately Jesus, you paid it all. And that heart posture of forgiveness, to not absorb it, to not make the other person absorb it, and ultimately for Jesus to pay it all, sets you up from a place of freedom where you can rightly say, okay, I have set a clear boundary, but I've set a clear boundary that may or may not happen, 
But ultimately, I live in this freedom of forgiving the other person in my heart because it is something that Jesus has already paid for. I found that when I separate those two things with people, they are much quicker to forgive because they realize that forgiveness doesn't mean acceptance or endorsement or affirmation or setting up the possibility for that abuse to happen again and again and again and again. We're called to forgive freely, but trust must be earned. To think of it this way, whenever there is a broken relationship, it could be because both people have done it. It could be because one person has done something or the other. But ultimately, what Scripture says is whether you've done the wrong or the other person has done the wrong, it is your responsibility to go to the person and to begin that process of forgiveness and hoped for reconciliation. Did you know that it says in Matthew 5, if you've done something wrong, you should go to the person. But in Matthew 18, it says, if somebody else has done something wrong, you should go to the person. And it might be confusing at first, but ultimately it puts the responsibility on every single Christian, whether you've done something or somebody else has done something to you to initiate that process. Reconciliation and ultimately forgiveness rarely happens if we wait for the other person to say, I'm sorry. But ultimately there is a way in which you can forgive or to ask for forgiveness in such a way that begins to, with baby steps, begin that process of reconciliation and restoration. Now, let me read another quote from this great book. Uh, again, this is Tim Keller's book on forgiveness. How can I and why should I? He says this, if a cartoonist wants to make someone look ludicrous, she can create a character. She can take something about a person's face that is unusual or a bit unattractive and exaggerate it, making it prominent so that the person looks foolish. That's exactly what your heart does when someone wrongs you. You think of them one-dimensionally in terms of that one thing they've done to you. If somebody has lied to you, you tell yourself she lied because she is just a liar. But if you were ever caught in a lie and someone asks why you lied, you say, well, yes, but it's complicated. I didn't mean, yes, you did lie, Tim Keller writes, but you were basically a good person. So while you continually to think of yourself as three-dimensional, complex human being, you start to think of the other person who lied to you as a one-dimensional villain. I see this play out so much in relationships, and I see it play out in society in a larger scale. This is originally airing just after the election. Now, there are many people who are looking at the other side and are reducing not only the other side, but individuals on the other side to a one-dimensional human being and thinking of, quote, our side as complex, as multidimensional, perhaps more human. That is the opposite of how God longs for followers of Christ to act. Ultimately, we are all made in the image of God, that we are all complex individuals trying to make sense of this world. We come to different conclusions about various things, including political platforms and the best way to do things. And ultimately, if we are Christians and if we are unable to forgive, it's often because we have reduced the other to some one-dimensional being. Praise God that God doesn't do that to us. Did you know that scripture says that we, in our own strength, in our own brokenness, we actually are enemies of God. And what does God do? God doesn't reduce us to a one-dimensional being. Out of love, God leaves the comfort of heaven to come in the form of a human being, fully God, fully human, the person of Jesus who lived the perfect life, died a sacrificial death so that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we would experience his righteousness and he would take away our sin, reconciling us back to God. I love how it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that because of this, we now view other people no longer from a human point of view. We are now ministers and ambassadors of reconciliation. That process begins with forgiveness. You can forgive without condoning, without agreeing, without saying, oh, it was okay, without just bear, without getting revenge, but ultimately saying that that's a wrong that Jesus paid for. I hope that you would stay not only for the rest of the service, but stay with us for the next few services in the weeks ahead as we talk also about 
the practice of remembering, and the practice of gratitude. But right now, let me pray. Loving God, we thank you for your forgiveness to us. It's complete, it's whole, it is exponential, it is cosmic. And I pray that out of the overflow that we as forgiven people would forgive others in a way that begins to transform and bring hope, not only to our relationships, but to the world at large. Jesus, you're doing a great thing in our midst. It's in your name we pray and we say together, amen. We'd love to share with you some of the many amazing things happening here at Bel Air Church this Christmas season. First is our Angel City Christmas concert on Sunday, December 8th at 4 and 7 p.m. right here on our beautiful campus. This stage will be filled with a 37-piece orchestra and a 60-voice choir. We also have two special guests joining us this year. We have our very own Director of Worship, Jameson Puckett, who is a contestant on the current season of The Voice. Yes, we're so excited for him. We also have Dove Award nominated American contemporary Christian artist, Tarian, flying in from Memphis, Tennessee, just to be with us. Tarian's unique blend of pop, R&B, and gospel influences continues to captivate audiences worldwide, solidifying her status as an artist to watch. This concert is an incredible opportunity to invite friends, colleagues, and neighbors. The event is ticketed, so visit belair.org slash Christmas to get yours. Then on Sunday, December 15th at 5 p.m., we will have our Angel City Christmas sing-along outside on the patio with an incredible view of the city. This is a free event for all ages where we'll have food trucks, sweet treats, hot cocoa, hot cider, fire pits, s'mores, all surrounded by the sound of your favorite Christmas carols sung around the piano. We at Bel Air also know that for many, the Christmas season can be especially hard. Maybe you're experiencing a loss or it's just been a tough year and you don't feel in much of a Christmas spirit. Well, you're not alone and we have a Christmas service just for you called Blue Christmas. On Wednesday, December 11th at 7 p.m., come for an intimate service of worship and prayer with a short message from a member of our ministry team. In every season of life, we want to stand with you and support you. I love that we have that service. And finally, join us on December 24th at 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. for our candlelight Christmas Eve service. This is one of my favorite services all year. You can find all the details of everything happening this year at belair.org slash Christmas, and we can't wait to see you there. May God bless you this week. And we'll see you this Christmas at Bel Air Church.